So in, in your book, you have a chapter called It's the Meat That Makes You Sweet, in right. which you dispel many of these common myths about the low-carb theory of diabetes, which, as you say in your book, demonizes both insulin and demonizes carbohydrates. Right. So the research, though, tells a completely different story. So can you tell us specifically how animal protein influences your ability to secrete insulin? Yeah. And let me tell you, it's not, it's, I can't tell you it's just the animal protein. It's everything that comes with the animal protein. You know, part of the thing, even though I wrote a book about protein, which is a macronutrient, which by me writing that makes me a reductionist. In other words, I'm reducing everything down to these macronutrients, which is crazy. I mean, what is protein? I hate it when I go, you know, to order a salad and the waiter says to me, would you like protein with that? Well, what, the, what do you mean do I want protein with that? He's like, well, do you want chicken? Well, I know there's more fat in chicken than there is protein, so you ask me if I want fat with my salad? Uh, and, you know, so it's a little bit, you know, when you're talking about an animal protein, you're not just eating animal protein, you're eating everything that comes with it. Um, what we know is that, and again, I'm talking about type 2 diabetes here, but even type 1 diabetic, I, I see a lot of type 1 diabetics that become type 2 diabetics also. In other words, they start out type 1, which is just simply their beta cells have been attacked as an autoimmune process, and they don't make insulin. Okay, so they're not making insulin. That's why their sugar is going up. That's their disease process. Over time, in eating a standard American diet, they start to get the same problems where they have to go up and up on their insulin intake because their cells are becoming insulin resistant. That's type 2 diabetes. And what, why are these cells becoming insulin resistant? Well, we now know that it has to do with something called intramyocellular lipids, which I'm sure you guys are gonna hear about from other speakers too. But basically what's happening is cells have insulin receptors on them. And the insulin receptor needs to be there in order for insulin to lock in. And when insulin locks in to the insulin receptor, sugar is allowed into the cells. The body uses the sugar, whatever the cell is, uses it for energy production. Now, if you get fat into that cell, the fat interrupts the, the, the cell's ability to make the insulin receptor. If the cell can't make the insulin receptor, you have to put more and more insulin around to get whatever receptor it can make, and then you can't get sugar into the cells. And then sugar starts building up, sugar starts building up, your body secretes even more insulin. Insulin does have an effect where it blocks fat breakdown which means even more fat goes into the cells. So it's a vicious cycle. You get fat accumulation. Now we know several things cause that fat accumulation. Obviously fats themselves. Uh, there has been some studies showing certain proteins or certain amino acids in protein uh, do seem to stimulate the influx. And I talk about that in the book. I don't know how scientific people want to get, but there's certain amino acids that cause the influx of, uh, uh, of fat into the cell. And the more fat that goes into the cell, the more insulin resistant the person's going to be. So can you tell us how animal protein influences your blood pH? Yeah, well, uh, again, it's going to come down to the amino acids. So all foods have all amino acids for the most part. I mean, obviously, some will, will be amino acid deficient in certain areas. But with plant proteins, they, people say, oh, plant proteins don't have an, enough of certain amino acids. They have enough of all amino acids. In fact, um, this uh, one nutrition professor at Stanford who's vegan uh, measured his amino acids in a day and found he wasn't even close to amino acid deficiency in any realm. But animal proteins have higher amounts of certain amino acids and plant proteins have higher amounts of certain amino acids. For instance, plant protein has a lot of glutamic acid. And that turns out to be really good because glutamic acid gets uh, converted to glut glutathione, which is a vasodilator and an antioxidant. And so we find that people that eat plant-based proteins tend to have lower blood pressure and that's probably the mechanism. Animal proteins are higher in certain amino acids and some of those amino acids have sulfur as attached to it. Now people think, you know, I see these people drinking uh, pH, low, uh, high pH water, like water of 11. That, 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 does not, that does no good. That doesn't change your pH. Your pH is very tightly contained by the body. But if you're putting a lot of sulfur into your body because you're eating a ton of amino acid, especially animal amino acid that's higher in sulfur type amino acids, and you're putting that into your body, your body has to buffer that. Now it buffers, so someone could be eating a ton of, so for instance, um, Gary Tobbs, 
he's a big proponent of eat as much fat as possible, right? And he put his labs up to show people that your cholesterol won't go up if you eat a bunch of fat. What he, he, he's not a doctor. He doesn't understand physiology at all. What he doesn't notice, and I noticed immediately on his labs, his CO2 level, which is a measure of your body's ability to uh, battle the pH, his was very low which means he's in metabolic acidosis. Now, if you measure his pH, his pH is 7.4, it's normal. But his body's struggling to keep it at 7.4. So how does it struggle to keep it at 7.4? Well, it does it using calcium. If you look at anybody on a high protein diet and you check their urine, they're losing a lot of calcium. Now, we used to think they were losing that calcium from their bones, but we now have discovered that they're actually probably losing it from their muscle. And, uh, Kevin Hall has done these just amazing studies. I, I don't know how he gets these studies done. He's in the NIH and he basically gets people and has them stay in the hospital for two months where he feeds them just nothing but a low carb diet or a low fat diet and measures the differences. He has had some very good, very elegant work, but you could see these people do lose muscle mass. And um, there was a great study by Ebeling that has this, I know the low carb people love this study because there was a slight, and I'm talking slight improvement in metabolic rate in people on a low carb diet. It was very, very small. But if you looked at those people's urine, there was tons of calcium in it. They didn't mention that anywhere in the abstract. Uh, and if you look at the C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation, it was high. And so what's basically happening is these people are going into inflammation. Uh, they're going into acidosis. Their body's having to fight this excess sulfur amino acids, and that's going to have side effects. Okay, so great. Now, uh, can you give us some insight into how the iron found in meat products is, could potentially be detrimental for diabetes health? Yeah, sure. So um, there's different kinds of iron. The iron that's found in meat products is called heme iron. And you always hear, I always hear doctors when someone's anemic, Oh, you need more iron, eat more meat. Um, the weird thing, and this is so funny. This is how, how crazy things get in the research world. I was at a conference where one of the lead researchers on heme iron was there, and she was giving very uh, detailed data into how she discovered that heme iron is very toxic to the beta cells of the pancreas. And it can actually, in the beginning, stimulate beta cells to over secrete and then cause beta cell dysfunction. And she was emphatic about the problems of heme iron. She even talked about the fact, and we know this too, that heme iron is very oxidizing and it can oxidize lipids and create free radicals, but she was focusing on the beta cells. And at the end of the talk, people are asking her questions about how she set up her studies and all that. And then someone asked her, what do you eat? on a day-to-day -day basis, which I thought was interesting because, you know, this is not a clinical researcher. This is a lab researcher. Uh, and the, the one thing I see in lab researchers that are strictly in a lab is they kind of miss the forest for the trees a little bit. They're so focused on their, you know, Petri dishes and stuff. No offense to them. We need their study, but they get so focused. They don't think about as much about the application in the real world. So this person asks her, what do you think about, you know, what do you eat every day? And the lady's like, Oh, well, um, I pretty much eat a low carb diet. And that kind of, I was like, what? So if you're eating a low carb diet, that means you gotta be eating a lot of meat. I mean, I suppose there's ways that's not gonna be the case, but I'm figuring in her, that's what's happening. And so she's eating heme iron. The one thing she's spent her whole life proving is bad for the pancreas. Uh, but basically the one thing we know about heme iron is, is toxic to beta cells, which are the cells that control uh, insulin secretion.